for the, the background noise, which hopefully will be very temporary. Welcome to today's Lunch with Haley event. Today we are going to be talking about killer staffing websites and what you can do to create really a, a fantastic staffing website, one that attracts more clients, that attracts more candidates, that becomes truly an integral part of your business. And on the call today, I have three members of Haley Marketing Group's creative team, Caitlin, Brian, and Mark, who are going to help you with some of the show and tell components of today's webinar. Really? Yeah. Excuse me one second. I think we've found who has the background. Uh, Todd, if you're on the line, I think your, uh, your microphone is live. All right. Now, for today's webinar, just to kind of give you a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about. <laughs> Thank you for the people harassing Todd. We'll do our best to see if we can kick him off. Can, now, let me check. I may have muted him. Can, you, can everyone please confirm if you can still hear me? Awesome. I think we, we got rid of the background noise. All right. Yay. It's fun with webinars. You never know what's going to happen. Okay, today's agenda, what are we going to talk about? Well, first and foremost, we're going to talk about what makes a killer staffing website. And, and you know, it's, a, it's sort of a misnomer. Uh, we're not hunting everybody down. But there really are vast differences between websites that perform, that act like really 24-7 silent salespeople for staffing organizations and websites that negatively impact your selling activities and your recruiting activities. And we're going to show you lots of examples of both. We're going to talk about something that I'm sure that everyone has seen emails on in the last few days, the Google apoc apocalypse. Uh, just two days ago, Google made a major change in their algorithms, and it is impacting how people find you, particularly on mobile. But we're going to talk about the truth and the fiction that's been going on, because there's been a lot of false advertising about the detriment to your company. We're going to take a look at the trends in staffing websites, and that's where our creative team is really going to be able to jump on the line and show you samples of some of the latest and greatest things they're doing. Websites have just been evolving incredibly over the last couple of years, and uh, our team will show you some of the trends in design, copy, features, and functionality that they are implementing into our client sites. We're going to wrap things up with... Uh, some advice on how to get the most return out of your website and what would a webinar on staffing websites be without a quick word from our sponsor in this case us so we'll finish up with that along the way guys if there are questions please ask um, beyond the sound challenges we're going to be doing a lot of screen switching today so we can show live examples of websites so be patient with us as we do this but if you do have questions shoot them in and we will do our best to answer everything along the way so that's started state excuse me let's jump in what is the purpose of your company's website we talk to people all the time who say that a website is essential to their business and other people who thinks it really doesn't matter who's checking out my website anyway well in staffing a website has a few core values to your business first and foremost it tells your story your clients your candidates you all know the first thing that they're going to do is they're going to check out your website if it's dull if it's me too if it looks like it's dated it's not a, a, a an appropriate representation of your firm your capabilities and your personality it's not telling your story effectively if people have to work to get the message it's not telling your story effectively a good website in a matter of seconds tells people who you are what you do why you're different and why they want to work with you your website also needs to get people to take action. It's got to get people on the client side to learn more and request more information on your services, to interact with you so that you can sell to them. And on the candidate side, we're looking to get good candidates to find your site and apply to your jobs. Your website should also be part of your positioning. The content on your website and that can be from the home page through the contact us page and particularly if you're blogging or you're adding other information to the site the content should position you as an expert it should help show you really understand staffing you really 
understand the specific niche markets you serve, you understand the economic value of the services you provide and how you can make an impact as a problem solver to your clients. Your website also should make your service process better. You know, websites are no longer brochures. They're an extension of your offices. They're a way for people to interact with your firm to search jobs, to apply for jobs, to get information on their payroll history or past staffing orders. The idea is that anything that a human being in your office can do, or almost anything, your website can help them to do better or help them to do it during more hours of the day. As your website is also one of your biggest credibility builders. Uh, we're always telling people, compare the amount of traffic, the number of people visiting your website, to the number of people visiting your offices. You're going to find it's 10 times, 100 times, maybe even 10,000 times more people hit your website. And they're coming to your website to find out about you. That is your number one credibility builder after your salespeople and your recruiters. And in some cases, people who find you before they talk to your salespeople or recruiters, that determines if they're ever going any further. Bottom line, a killer staffing website is about helping you to sell more, to be working for you every minute, every day, every week, all year long. So at Haley Marketing, we build a lot of staffing websites. And what do we see that's wrong with sites? Well, there's a lot of things that you can go look at your site and say, do we fail any of these tests? Too many sites are boring. The content is corporate, too long, nobody's going to read it. The design is weak. It doesn't represent the company that created the website very well. If you profess to be a high-quality staffing organization and you have a low-quality website, well, guess what? People are going to associate you with the low-quality website, not the words you use to describe the high-quality organization. Too often we see Me Too copy. You know, we're the best at service. We do a better job screening candidates. And that Me Too copy does nothing to differentiate your services. Very often there's either no SEO or people who are using outdated SEO practices. And we're not going to talk a lot about SEO today, but if you want to see our full webinar on it, go to our website, go to the freebie section, go to the recorded webinars, and you can watch our team present an hour on how to have great web SEO for your site. Very often there's poor social integration. What we typically see is people like to have social integration that takes people away from their website. Why would we want to do that? We want social integration that gets people to follow your website, that brings people to your website. Very often there's clunky navigation. It's not intuitive. If people have to figure out what to do, they're not going to stick around. They're going somewhere else. Uh, it's not optimized for mobile. The Google Mageddon did hit. And the fact is the navigation, or excuse me, the, the site must be completely optimized for mobile job seekers, mobile clients, if you want to show up on mobile searches. There are often too few calls to action. We're not doing enough to get people to take the next step. Or there are crappy calls to action where they're just too weak. They're not specific direction of things that add value for the visitor. It's hard to update the site. If you can't easily update your site, you need to make changes so that you can update content without having to call a developer every time you want to change an address. It's not integrated with your sales team. Your website should directly feed leads to your sales team. It should directly feed candidates to your recruiters. Bottom line, you should be able to measure that your website is getting results. So when building a website, what are some of the things you need to consider? And we're going to spend more time on this, so I'm going to kind of quickly talk about the things to consider. Number one is your positioning, how you want to be seen. Two, the credibility. How can you prove your value in the marketplace? Number three is education. What do we need to teach clients and candidates about and how do we incorporate that into our website today, tomorrow, and years from now to be teaching people better ways to use our services? What are the desired actions we want people to take and how are we going to drive people to those actions? 
And lastly, how are we going to measure the success of our site? Is it the number of leads or job applications we get? Is it the number of downloads or forms completed? Is it visits to the site? Is it by our bounce rate, our time on the site, our goals completed? Is it where we rank on searches or the amount of search traffic? These are all ways you could measure the success of your site. And you want to look at a site, a website as probably a three to a maximum five year investment. What are we going to measure on that investment to ensure we got a good return on the, what we've spent. All right, so that's the, the intro to creating a killer staffing website. And before we get into the show and tell, I want to address this Google apocalypse and the truth versus the fiction. First, the truth. April 21st was not the end of the world, despite the emails you may have been receiving this week. Yes, Google changed their algorithms. They said that if your search is not optimized for mobile, you will be degraded in mobile search results. So what does that really mean? It means people looking for you on a mobile device are less likely to find you if your site is not mobile optimized. So mobile is now much more important than it was two days ago. However, it only affects about 20 to 30 percent of your web traffic and we know that because we watch analytics on 500 staffing firm websites each and every month and that's what we're seeing on average is 20 to 30 percent we have seen as high as 35 percent of companies traffic is coming from mobile devices so it's important but it's not the end of the world that Google made this change April 21st was simply a reminder that your website needs regular updates and if you're not mobile put a plan in place to get optimized for mobile sooner rather than later now we're going to talk about designing for mobile and this is not my area of expertise so there are some things I know you should cons consider and, and then we're going to turn over to the creative team to talk a little more about this so you're going to need to consider things like responsive design versus a separate mobile site and then creating a mobile optimized experience with faster page loads, less content, easy access to features and, and the ability to respond and Brian if you wouldn't mind give us a, a little overview of some of the options people can consider when it comes to mobile. Yeah, sure thing, David. Uh, so, so as David explained, there's two real options for addressing your mobile site, and it's responsive or separate. Um, and the separate option can come in two different forms. Uh, it can be having a totally separate website managed somewhere else on something like an M dot subdomain, at Haley do. Um, what we at Haley do is we do design all of our sites responsively, meaning that no matter what your browser width is, uh, the website's going to look good and it's going to uh, respond to the context that you're, that you're looking at inside of. But what we also do is we install a plugin that allows us to, to a certain extent, manage the site a little bit separately. Um, the advantages that we get out of this, is, out of the separate site versus the responsive, is that it decreases the number and the size of the assets that we load. Uh, that's things like any code that, that we're writing, scripts, style sheets, plugins, all of that, images. Uh, it also allows us to strategize a little bit differently to include or exclude particular pieces of content based on whether or not they're relevant to your mobile users. Um, it also allows us to specifically optimize your site to a particular range of devices. And again, that's, that's our separate site approach. Our starter websites, for instance, are all still built responsively, but we take this separate site approach first, and that's the primary site that you end up seeing uh, with us. Like I said, um, it's because of all those advantages that we get. And what we've seen from these advantages is a 50 to 70 percent improvement in page load time on our mobile sites over on our separate mobile sites over our responsive versions. So David, can you head to the next slide on here? You got it. All right. So if you take a look at this, this is one of our starter websites, and that is the desktop version that you're seeing right now. Um, can we pull in those next two mobile? All right. So this is the responsive version of that website, meaning that if you were to take that website on your desktop and just narrow your browser window down, 
it would respond and begin to look differently at each breakdown until you got all the way to a, to a very narrow browser. Um, this could also be seen in the phone. But you can see the similarity between the desktop and the, and the responsive version, but there's obviously a difference. Next to that, the, the new version that we just brought up is looking very similar to the responsive site, but this is our separate mobile site. So as you see, we can, we can accomplish the same aesthetics, but the, the underlying code behind it is, is very, very different. Um, the number of, like I said, the number of assets, scripts, the size of the images that we're loading, all of that is much, much smaller. So the page load time, that's where we're getting that 50 to 70% difference. So we can accomplish the same aesthetics with a responsive site and a separate site, but we have been noticing the way that we build that the separate sites are getting a huge, huge performance enhancement. Great. Thanks, Brian. And, and one of the things about SEO and the way Google is making changes, not only do they give more credit to sites that are mobile optimized, but part of the way they give credit is how fast does the site load. So having the separate mobile version allows us to control the interface and improve the performance of the site. Thanks very much, Brian. All right, we're going to jump on now and start looking some more show and tell, looking at design trends. All right. I'm going to flip the slide, and I'm about to put up a bunch of bullets that, uh, that you're going to see why we have the creative team on the phone with us. We're going to talk about trends like flat design versus material design, mobile first versus re as a subsegment of responsive design, tall pages, trends in full screen images and background video, the uh, supposed death of stock photography, and iconography. All right, Mark, because a lot of this is a, a language that you speak better than I do. If you wouldn't mind, let's take a look at some examples of flat versus material design. Sure. Thanks, David. So like anything else, web design goes through a lot of trends. And it used to be that there was a language that we called skeuomorphism. And skeuomorphism is an old word. It goes back about 125 years. And what it basically means is that um, you're designing something to look like something else. So if you remember, a lot of you will remember old wooden, the woody station wagons with wood paneling on the side. And none of those station wagons really had real wood. It was just vinyl with a print on it, but it was made to look like the actual thing. And that's a decent example of it. And what we saw in web design was a lot of chrome textures, brushed metal. Um, if you used an iPhone back in 2011 and you used iBooks, you'd notice the, uh, the bookshelf background, those are all examples of skeuomorphism. A couple of years ago, it moved to flat design, which aimed to really get rid of everything. It was very stripped down. You used as few colors as possible, but they were very bright, and it was pretty easy to see where the user was supposed to go. It created a really clean effect, and it was especially good for mobile because it reduced load times because you didn't have to load stuff like gradients or extra images where you didn't need to. And then last year, uh, Google introduced another language called Material Design, which really kind of built on Flat Design. And what it did was it introduced a 3D layer to Flat. So you see subtle shadows. You see stuff moving around nowadays. And what it does is it creates interactions between all of the different objects on your screen. So you can see something that's more important is going to pop out a little more at you. If you look at the screenshot over there, for example, that's the Google Inbox app. And that little red circle in the bottom right corner, that's the action that you're supposed to take. That's to compose a new email. Um, but flat, or material design rather, it, it's more responsive than anything we've really seen. Everything interacts with each other, and all of the different elements uh, transition depending on what screen you on, you're on. And every single, thing, every single interaction that you have will mean something different. So, Mark, what do you think are the biggest benefits of this transition from skeuomorphic to flat to material design? I think that everything's a lot more clear nowadays. You know what your actions are supposed to be, and instead of just having uh, animation for the sake of animation, you're starting to see more meaningful animations. So if you open something up, it's going to pop up at you. It's going to clear everything off to the side, and you know what you're supposed to look at. All right, so there goes all that eye candy I liked, and now it's time for me to really take actions. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. All right, Caitlin, I'm going to bring you on the line now and have you if, talk to us a little bit about the concept of mobile-first design. 
Sure, thanks, David. So mobile first might be a topic that you've heard of or seen, um, and all it really means is just that. In designing or developing a website, um, designers will consider the mobile site first and then enhance it and expand to that site as it goes up into a larger screen on a tablet or a desktop. Um, at Haley Marketing, we've, we've embraced this approach, but we're also not huge fans of it because only 20 to 30 percent of our clients' web traffic currently is on mobile. So why should we enhance the mobile experience when the majority of users are still on desktop? Instead, we like to design on a desktop and create a site that gracefully resizes into the smaller screens. So as the screen shrinks, we eliminate content that slows down load times on mobile devices, but we don't limit the design by starting with the smallest screen. That being said, however, mobile traffic is on the rise, and we do develop our sites on a mobile-first framework, so we can adapt to that, to either approach, really, when necessary, depending on the statistics of your own website traffic. Great. Thanks, Caitlin. All right. We're going to take our, our first shift of drivers, and we're going to go take some look at some live websites with tall pages and background images. So, Brian, I'm going to shift over control to you. All right. And... Bear with me one second. We will make you the presenter. And then you can take over and show us your screen and show us some examples of tall pages and background images. And I, and I do apologize while we're transitioning. I understand that GoToWebinar is still having some intermittent issues with sound cutting in and out. So I apologize. The good news is we are recording all of this. So if there's anything that you miss, it will, the recording will be available next week. All right, what screen are you guys seeing right now? You're seeing the Talent Rover design. Perfect. All right, so Talent Rover, uh, talent, uh, well, in the past about two years or so, we've seen a little bit of a growing trend towards large, full-width imagery on websites and websites with tall pages or single-page websites. The, the idea behind this is to place all of your most important content right there on the home page for your visitors. This results in less clicks uh, for your users to get where they're trying to go, less frustration with them looking for content, a little bit of a smoother experience, and users just aren't stuck searching for what they came for. We're more strategically presenting um, that content on the home page to them. So Talent Rover, like you're looking at right now, is a good example of not just these, these big full-width imagery that, that I was talking about, but full with video as well. Um, with you know new computers, new browsers, we're able to begin loading a lot more and start doing some cooler things with these websites because the computers can just handle it. So one of those things is this full page uh, or full width video. See, as soon as you come to Talent Rover's website and it gives you a little bit idea a little bit of an idea of their, their culture, their offerings, and just, just kind of what they're all about. We scroll down, and you see over here on the right, I've got this set of navigation, which will bring me from section to section. The features overview, what their support is like, um, a couple quick forms to, uh, to fill out regarding their training videos and knowledge base. Um, their Salesforce overview, but you'll see each one of these were it's it's more than what home pages were doing a few years ago, which was maybe an image, a little bit of about us copy, and then navigation that brought you to the other pages, which may have what you're really looking for. They're bringing different aspects from all the different uh, kind of subsections of their website right here on their home page, so that there's a chance that you may not even need to spend time digging around or searching for that content. They're presenting all of the most important stuff to you right on their home page with some simple navigation along the right-hand side. It all concludes at the bottom with a, with a quick contact form, uh, hopefully capturing some leads, uh, getting the visitor in contact with them so that they can then take control over the situation and, and begin a conversation. Another example of these uh, of these longer, uh, big image, one page, or, uh, or long home page sites is, this is another one of Haley Marketing's uh, starter websites. This one has four or five or six different sections, each one you can see with a brief, small amount of copy and a clear call to action. Um, at the bottom again, uh, there's this navigation to bring you from section to section. 
each one you see there's there's some sort of supporting background image that does provides a stage for the content that that we're trying to get you to see and a call to action again here's an opportunity to search for jobs the next section uh, brief amount of copy and a call to action to request an, uh, request an employee again request an employee or search for jobs we're we're taking into consideration what most of the users are coming to this website for and we're presenting them to you on that home page without forcing them to, to take more action and and dig around so like I said it just it eliminates frustration it eliminates clicks it gets them to where we want them to be quicker uh, one more we can probably show one more of these um, Berks and Beyond is another great example of a long home uh, long home page They've got a, a bit of a slideshow at the top. Again, you'll see these background images, which are spanning the full width. But again, you'll see primar primarily users are coming because they're job seekers looking for jobs, or they need to place an employee. They're, they have a position that they need to fill. Maybe they want to check out some testimonials like we have here to, to get a little bit of background information, other people's opinions on the company. That's also provided. They also uh, do a great job blogging, establishing themselves as a, as a leader in the industry. That's one more thing that they're putting on that home page. Oh, an interesting video as well, again, showing a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of their personality, what separates them from their competitors. And then, again, it concludes at the bottom with a call to action, a contact us form, some way for the user to get in touch with the people at Berks. Awesome. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate that. And just so everybody knows, we're looking at sites through the GoToWebinar platform. So you're seeing like videos that, uh, on the talent rover that you can't actually see the fluid mov movement of the video simply because we're broadcasting screenshots individually from Brian's screen through GoToWebinar after the, this presentation is over. Feel free to go to any of these sites and check them out for themselves to see how the tall pages work, how full screen background images work, and how background video works. Now we're going to transition over to Mark, speaking of some of the imagery, to, to get into more detail about chain stock photography, and we're going to talk about iconography. But while we're doing that, Mark, I just transitioned to you to set it up. We had a question come in. Someone was wondering if our discussion about mobile, we were saying that it's better to have a mobile.staffingwebsite.com than www.staffingwebsite.com. And I'm pretty sure that's what nobody meant. What we're really talking about is having a separate mobile plugin to create a different mobile experience. But guys, what's your thought on that, having a mobile dot versus having the mobile within www? Uh, well, having the having the end dot, I mean the URL that that they visit your website at, um, that's that's not as much the issue. Ideally, you keep that all on the on the same domain, um, same area, so that it looks like the same website. But yeah, a lot of the a lot of the separate mobile site approaches, like I, th I think I may have touched on at the beginning, they do an actual separate site managed in a separate area. Uh, that makes it really really difficult to maintain that website because every piece of content that you may be updating will need to be updated in two separate places if you if you keep copy the same between your mobile site and your full site that's two different places that you're managing it the way that we do it uh, with with our plugin through WordPress is the actual the actual content on most of the pages is managed in in one area we just treat it differently as we bring it into to their mobile site and to their full site so we're we use a little bit of a hybrid process that minimizes uh, that need for all the extra work because we we to a certain extent treat it like a separate site but it's not managed in a separate area it's all still managed in the same area with us awesome thanks Brian all right Mark let's talk about stock photos and iconography Thanks, David. When you hear about the death of stock photos, it's a lot of talk about all the cliche stuff that you've seen before, people shaking hands, business people just staring at the camera, smiling, that sort of thing. But uh, your photos on your website should be used to convey a message much more effectively. You can back up everything that your website is talking about and really push that idea home. Your audience should be able to relate to the pictures that you choose or the pictures that you choose should be able to create a positive emotional response for the people viewing your site. And apart from stock photos, there's other options. You can use infographics, and that way you can organize data effectively and make large amounts of that data easily easy to digest for the reader. 
they're easier to read than, say, a long white paper. And they use graphics and copy to tie data together to create ideas that are really, really effective. Plus, they're beautiful. And then, in addition to infographics and stock photos, you can use icons and other symbols. They're easy to understand, they're fast to load, they don't distract from the message, and icons tend to be pretty recognizable. Um, if a good idea for icons is if you can't think of an image for an idea in 10 seconds or less, it's probably not a good icon to use. David, if you don't mind going to the next slide, we can show off some examples. Oop, actually we're on your screen. Oh, yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, so th this client, INSAF, they use a lot of non-traditional stock photos. And these aren't, most of them aren't actually stock photos. They're illustrations that kind of uh, back up what INSAF does. Everyone's tired of seeing the same old stuff. So INSAF uses bright colors. They use um, concepts to really show off what they're doing. But if you want a more photographic look and you don't mind having a little bit of fun with your website, you can, show, you can use stock photos to show off your personality. This client, McGrath, had some really fun options. Uh, and Brian was actually the one that built this. And he chose photos from one photographer. And it was all a very coherent look. So if you look through their website, it's very fun. And you can see it on all of their pages that they don't mind being a little bit out there just to show what kind of company they are. As for icons, we've do, we do a lot of stuff with icons. And one of our starter sites, we decided to do something a little bit different. And for this starter, we decided to hand draw the icons to kind of give it a more handcrafted look, something that still carried the idea of each each market that the client would potentially try to, re to reach. And what we've seen with some of our other clients is that that purchased this starter is that they, they've wanted to customize it a little bit. So they've added additional icons in the same style that we've hand drawn custom for them. Finally, there's Burks, who Brian mentioned earlier. And these clients were very fun. This client was very fun to work with because they were a little bit out there and they knew they allowed us to have fun with their site. But on top of the big images that are admittedly a little strange, they have a lot of icons on their site. And as you can see, they're simple, they're bold. And even if you covered up the supporting text, you would be able to see, to tell exactly what each, um, each service that they provide is. And David, I think that's it for icons. All right, awesome. Thanks, Mark. I'm going to take control back over. and. Uh... Let's see. Make me the presenter again, and we will go back to the PowerPoint. So bear with me. All right, and our next topic is copy. But while we're, we're bringing copy up, there have been a few questions that have come in that I would like to address. Um, first question was about those tall pages, guys. And the, uh, the, the person who asked the question said, you know, I go, see those tall pages. They look beautiful, but most of the copy is below the fold. Uh, doesn't that cause a problem with people not recognizing that there's more content on the page? What are your thoughts on this? Well, one of the things that we generally try to do on those, on those large pages is either turn on the home page turn that if it's a single page site the the primary navigation at the top will generally navigate you down the page instead of to another section of the website so even if they don't initially realize that that there's more content below when they go to navigate somewhere else they are brought to that same page or just brought to a lo lower point on the page uh, the other option is on our on the Haley starter that we showed and on talent rover we offered a secondary form of navigation, up and down arrows, which if those aren't there, I can understand um, it, it may be not being clear that there's more important content below the fold on that page, but when you, when you add those arrows in, it, it makes it clear that that's your secondary call to action. That's something we're intending you to click on, and we're intending you to dig a little bit further down the page. So 
it's all about providing providing them with those options. If you're not making it clear that they should spend more time and look a little bit further on the homepage, they may not. So it's, it all comes down to strategy. Thanks. And I also think for, for mobile users, if it's an iPad or a phone, people are used to swiping to scroll. So you're very used to content being lower on the page. And that's sort of transitioning back up to desktop sites. It's becoming more of a norm to have content that's below that first screen that people used to see and be worried about anything being below the fold. A couple of other questions. Um, Brian, you mentioned that WordPress plugin that we're using to do the mobile sites. Um, somebody asked for the name of it, so it's WP Touch, correct? Yes. All right. Uh, another question was about the, the mobile traffic itself and that 20 to 30 percent of talent, and actually it's 20 to 30 percent of all visitors to our client's website are coming from mobile devices. The trend has been going up. Up over the last few years, we saw a fairly dramatic spike about two years ago, and now it's sort of leveling off. It's still increasing. The, the person who asked the question said, "What's our forecast for the next five years?" The answer is, we can only anticipate more mobile. Um, more people are buying iPads than buying laptops. That means we're going to have more mobile. Uh, you know, I don't know exactly the impact of the new Apple Watch, but it's going to drive the trends towards more mobile, which means. You have to think about your desktop user, your corporate user, your client is probably going to be a desktop user for many years to come. But your candidate, if they can't search jobs and apply to jobs and really navigate your site from a smartphone, your site is going to fail them and you're going to lose them to the competition. All right, and, and the last question I'll address right now has to do with the topic we're about to talk about. So it's a great segue. And the amount of copy and copy trends and how does that influence SEO? So before we talk about copy and SEO, let's just kind of quickly address the trends. Trends we're seeing in copy, number one, shorter copy. As you've seen in most of the examples so far, we, you don't see long paragraphs of text. You see individual sentences. You see single words. You see phrases and buttons with words on them. It's a less is more philosophy. We're also looking at storytelling. How do we use copy in sections so as you scroll through a site, we are telling the story about your organization, what you're all about, how you're different, but we're not doing it like reading a book. We're doing it more like giving a slideshow or a PowerPoint presentation. In a great PowerPoint presentation, there's very few bullets, very few words per slide. It's mostly about the images. If you incorporated PowerPoint into your Website, you think of it the same way. Each time my visitor is looking at a page, I need to direct them to the specific action I want them to take. And the more copy I force them to read, the less likely it is they're going to take that action. But I still want to tell a great story, and that's where those tall pages come in, where we can scroll down and after section after section after section be telling the story. Mark also mentioned infographics, and we'll see an example in just a minute of the rise of infographics as a replacement for traditional content, and then the use of stronger and more frequent calls to action. So on screen right now, you see an example of several of these things. This is the top of a home page of a company where they consolidated their value proposition down to a single sentence. All the benefits of a big name search consultant, but we don't charge their big time fees. Don't hire better, hire perfect. What we do, specialties, career help. Very intuitive, very simple, but they didn't need to have two paragraphs to explain that they're recruiters and they have some very innovative service options. So let's take a look at some other examples. And Brent, we'll do it right on screen here in PowerPoint. Okay. But what, what are we seeing here on the screen? So here, this is, uh, it's like David was saying, um, shorter copy gets to the point quicker. People are people are on your website not because they want to spend time on your website. You have the best looking website in the world, but people aren't there just to spend time on it. So getting the message to them as clearly and quickly as possible is huge. And making sure that they that you're conveying your message and that they are reading the important parts. So right here we have we have an example of what most websites would have listed out as just a, a short bulleted list. Any sort of you know lists or processes, you can take an extra step, um, put it in a table, maybe toss in some icons, present it in a more clear and and uh, graphically dominant and pleasing way. So this is going to be more impactful than if I just had six bullet points listed in the middle of my copy. This this is much more uh, clear and easy to read. I get I get the point without without 
having to read paragraphs and paragraphs of copy. And there's no way I'm just scrolling past that. The example on screen right now, this, if you, uh, Team One Medical, if you had gone to this website and loaded the page, you would see not only this, this set of infographics, which is interesting in and of itself. This is, this is a much more interesting way to provide these statistics and percentages than just mixing it into copy. But the extra little step that Team One Medical and, and, and Haley did was when this page loads, all of those individual numbers animate and scroll from zero up to whatever their current value is. So it's just an extra little memorable factor, an extra little piece that, that draws a user's eye there. And again, it, it, it presents these statistics in a much more aesthetically pleasing way than just mixing them in with the copy. Burks. Um, again, we've got <laughs> uh, these. These. This website is interesting, but we've got we've got very short copy with a call to action, and they're reinforcing their their message and who they are with interesting imagery. So the imagery really shouldn't be underestimated as 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 a way to it, to convey your message and to assist with copy. So you know they're they're drilling their point home that they're different. And, and then they follow up with very, very brief, short copy and a clear call to action. Yeah, and again, it's, it's really about using the images to help tell the story. So if this had been a picture of uh, six people in suits or maybe one empty chair, um, which could have been needing help for their firm, it would not have had nearly the same a impact as uh, this rather unusual gentleman sitting in his bathtub. Absolutely. I mean, I... I, I build staffing websites for a living, and I'm on a lot of them. And if I had come to that page, there's not a chance I would have forgotten it. That that sticks with me. All right, and, and the last one, which we were going to do a live sample of, but because of the, the lag issues with Speed Over GoToWebinar, I'm just going to describe this one. Um, we talked about storytelling, and this, this particular company, the Squires Group, they have a very unique process they refer to as in the perfect space. And when you come to their website, you actually can use your mouse to scroll through a completely animated presentation that walks you through their value proposition, literally like a children's storybook that's animated. And it, as you're scrolling, everything's changing. The messages are changing. You can go at your own pace, depending on how fast you want to read and see what it says. But they're using their website as a much more advanced version of a company presentation or brochure, but to be able to tell every single visitor, whether you're a client or a job seeker, here's why we're special. Here's why we're different. Here's why you want to have a conversation with us so that when they do have a conversation with the sales team, they can focus on the end value of their in the perfect space value proposition as opposed to starting cold. Right. Uh, I mean they're 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 presenting this copy in a in a much more interesting way than most. They actually basically supplied a little a short narrative to bring the user through. And and as they as they navigate through there's different scenes that come in which honestly entice the user to that to want to see more. And it concludes at the bottom with a, a short contact form and again a clear call to action, collecting information and getting them in touch with, with uh, the Squires group. All right, and before we move on to features, we've had two different questions come in about copy and SEO, and does having shorter copy negatively impact SEO, or how much copy should you have? The very quick answer is yes, less copy means that on an individual page you've got less words to rank for, so it could have a potentially negative impact on that page. However, You'll see when we present SEO in a little bit, there's really been a radical change in philosophy in SEO because of the way Google's changed. We're thinking about SEO not just for the keywords that drive people to one specific page, but we're thinking about it in terms of driving overall traffic to your website. And what methods can we use to increase the total volume of traffic and the total number of keywords driving traffic? So when we get to the SEO section of this presentation, we'll give you a little bit of an overview of how staffing companies are writing shorter copy, but still finding ways to get better SEO results. And with that said, Caitlin, we're going to turn it over to you, and we're going to talk about some of the latest features that staffing firms are incorporating into their website. So I'll bring a list up on the screen, and then you can uh, take it away from here. Sure. Thanks, David. So the first on this list is going to be dynamic content. And if you want to go to the next slide, David. We can show an example of that. So here's an example um, 
of a location page. So a company with multiple locations might want to consider doing something like this because it really highlights each individual location and gives that location a personality, a page to land on, which is great for SEO. And you can see all the different types of content that we're bringing into this. This is just a concept right now. Um, but you can see there's an image, there's Google Maps, there's the address and contact information, programs that this location serves. The available opportunities is a feed of jobs. The latest news section is a feed from the blog. And then there's also the meet the team section at the bottom so this just represents so many different feeds, content, images that can go on your website to really make every page optimized, stand out, and really useful. And you also, some of the questions about SEO, this is a great example of having an, a page for every office filled with content that's relevant to that local market. This is one of the ways that we're having content drive SEO, but now at a deeper level in the website than just worrying about filling that home page with copy. Exactly. So the next trend is really um, an increase in smart interactive navigation. So you can see in this example, this is one of our starters. Um, first we have that top main navigation in black. That remains fixed up there at the top as the user scrolls throughout the site. And that's really so that at any given time the user sees the navigation, can click it, can get can know exactly where they are on the website and get to any other portion easily. In the second screenshot, you'll see that the sub-navigation and that yellow bar also remains fixed at the top as the user scrolls. So it condenses that header area, but the navigation is still there and is still visible. And if you want to go to the next slide, David. This is another example that takes it even a little bit further. That top navigation still remains fixed to the top of the screen, but as the user scrolls, the overall height of that header decreases. So you'll see that social media links disappear and the logo shrinks in size from a um, vertical version to a more horizontal condensed version. So with the result of this, as the user is scrolling down the page, they still have access to the navigation, but it doesn't take as much real estate up on the screen. So I think that these trends um, kind of try to predict the user's behavior. As the user is scrolling down the screen, they probably don't want to go anywhere else. They want to read the content on the screen. And I've seen some sites taking it even a step further where they hide the navigation completely, but as you as a user scrolls up or hovers their mouse to the top of the screen, then the navigation shows. And that's just intuitive. I think it's a mobile first kind of um, thought process. If you think about when you scroll on your phone, as you're sh scrolling down, navigation might hide, and as soon as you scroll the other direction, there's the navigation again. So I've seen that a lot going onto websites, and I think it's something that's intuitive and very user-friendly. All right, our next feature is the large format dropdown. So you're probably familiar with dropdowns. Um, as soon as you hover over the top level, you'll see all the subpages in that section. This takes it a little further and does a large format dropdown. So as you hover, resources, hover over resources in this example, you see all of the different resources with subheadings and links so you can access any area of the site with one click. That's really the main goal of the large format dropdown. And in the next example, you'll see that you can take it further than just links to pages and include things like images, blog feeds, you can have text, you can have forms, you can have all sorts of things in the drop down. So you want to keep it simple and really easy to read, but it doesn't have to be just a static list of links. Next is the job board and job board trends that we've seen. Um, a lot of different things have been happening with job boards lately, and we've tried to incorporate as many as possible into our own job board. First, all jobs should really be on your own domain. This helps with SEO. Um, it helps blend your job board into your site so you don't have to leave and go to a third party, um, but you keep all of that traffic on your site. And speaking of SEO, all jobs themselves should really be optimized for SEO so that the URL isn't something like company.com slash job ID 79432, something like slash job slash outside sales representatives in Buffalo, New York. That really helps with your SEO when job seekers are looking for jobs on your site. Next, we really want 
your job board to be mobile optimized, especially in regards to the search and the apply process. Job seekers are looking online more than ever, and they're on their phones, they're on tablets, and they need to be able to apply as quickly and easily as possible from that device. You also want your job board to be able to integrate with your ATS, as well as social media and job aggregators, so you can do things like push your jobs out to Indeed and also capture applications with LinkedIn. It's really important to grab all of that traffic. And finally, you want your job board to really give you the ability to create and nurture your own private talent pool with things like signups and special customized searches. You want to get the best talent pool and the most information out of that talent pool as possible. Our next concept is landing pages. So a landing page is usually a one-page site that exists either within your website or outside of your website. Um, the biggest thing to consider with a landing page is that, is that it needs one primary focus. Everything on that page should be clear and should be pointing to that one focus. This can be a page that you use as the landing page for a promotion you're doing, an advertisement, a pay-per-click campaign, anything that can drive traffic to this page. Um, we've seen a few trends in landing pages lately. First, you want everything, you want a clear call to action that's high on the page. So in this case, you have a heading that's even before the logo. So while there is some branding in here, it doesn't need links to other pages, it just needs that one clear call to action, in this case, request an employee. We've also seen that content is easier to digest in this visual format, so use things like bullet points. Use things like steps, one, two, and three. That's much more effective than long paragraphs of text. And you can also consider adding something like a testimonial in there to build the trust and to build the reputation of that page. Excellent. Thanks, Caitlin. And before we go on to, to a couple of the additional features, um, there were several questions that came in that I think we should address. Number one is just what's the general stance on drop-down boxes? Are there research that shows that people are hesitant to use them? And I think um, we kind of showed the drop-downs where you have to click one drop-down and that opens another drop-down and that opens another drop-down. Those are hard to use and they don't work very well. But looking at something like a large format where any page on your website is one click away, we found to be very effective as a form of navigation. But the second drop-down question was really about the impact on mobile. And so, creative team, um, how are we incorporating the use of drop-downs when we move to mobile? Because clearly we're not doing large format drop-downs. Right. So first I would say that a large format drop-down isn't the right solution for everyone. Um, it, it's really intended for sites that have a lot of content, a lot of pages. If your site is pretty simple, you probably don't need one. Um, that being said, on mobile, we want to strip that down even with the bigger sites. Um, typically, when you're on a mobile site, you're not going three levels deep onto a website. So um, mobile, we really focus on showing those top levels of navigation, and those really need to be optimized to the top level that you want to show on your site. Um, but there's also a lot of things we can do on mobile to show drop-downs on click, um, to toggle the navigation, to show and hide it in different ways, and that will still allow you to get anywhere in the site pretty easily. Excellent. Thank you. So basically, the, the, the short answer is on mobile, it's, it's just like everything else. It's about making it simpler. And mostly on mobile, you see the net menus are already dropped down. You'll see they call it a hamburger, that little three-line symbol, usually in the upper corner of a mobile web page and that is a drop down that allows you access to other pages but in general you keep most of the navigation hidden on mobile so you can have more room on screen for the content that someone's trying to read. All right now there are a couple of features that our team has developed over the last several years and a couple just in the last year so I'm going to do a little show and tell of what the guys on today's call have helped to create. So three things we're going to take a look at, the Talent Showcase, our Team BIOS Manager, and our Testimonials Manager custom plug-in options. First up is the, the Talent Showcase, and skill marketing has been a tried and true method of selling staffing services for the last 20 or 30 years. The Talent Showcase is about taking skill marketing to a whole new level by incorporating it into your website with a visual 
interface and the ability for people to drill down, get information on candidates that look interesting, and then contact the recruiter associated with those candidates. It's kind of a very easy way for the recruiter to generate more inbound leads. And in just a couple of weeks, we're actually going to be doing a Lunch with Haley product demo webinar where I'll show you the talent showcase in great detail. The second thing we're doing is the team bios manager, and we have lots of clients that like to have very nice professional biographies on their website, but sometimes they want their bio to have a little more fun. So in this particular example, we designed the bios on this site so that we could present everybody with their nice professional corporate headshots, provide a full bio of information that's available on click, allow them to email or connect on LinkedIn, and then have the pictures change as we mouse over the individual people in their organization. The, the last one I'm going to talk about quickly is the idea to have custom post types uh, and our testimonials manager and our case studies manager are one example of or two examples of these custom post types. The idea is that just like a blog post exists in a database, we can create a unique type of post around content that you're regularly going to want to create and manage, testimonials being a perfect example. So we can create testimonials so that we can assign them to categories. This is a client testimonial. This is a candidate testimonial. We can create them as subcategories. This is an industrial client. This is a clerical client. This is an IT client. And then we can use the RSS feed capabilities of your WordPress database to feed testimonials that match certain criteria to relevant pages on your website or to feed them outside your website to your social media accounts. The nice thing about these custom post types is they're very easy to manage. It allows you to have all kinds of different content within your website that can be diff visually different. Like you see the example of the, the testimonials showing up over a graphic on the EQ search site, different than other content, and that we can use them anywhere on your site or off your site once they're set up in their own custom post type category. All right, switching gears. We've got a few minutes left and just a few things left to go. Search engine optimization. We talked about a little bit the, the impact of shorter copy. One of the trends we're also seeing is a less focus on individual keywords and more focus on total traffic from search engines. So it used to be everyone would contact and say, I need to rank number one for s staffing in Buffalo, New York, if they were in Buffalo, New York. And while it's still important to rank well for specific search terms related to the services you provide in your geographic market, sometimes it's just not practical to invest in SEO because there's too much competition for those words. Like, for example, if you provide IT people and you have IT jobs, well, guess what? You're not likely to knock off Monster and Career Builder and Indeed and Simply Hired and zip recruiter for IT jobs because they've got millions of pages of content to your one or your 10 or 20. They're going to have more relevancy. They're going to rank higher. So we're going to look at how can we have more pages on your site rank for specific jobs, rank for jobs in specific markets, rank for other things that IT candidates would be searching for. And we want a strategy of constantly adding content to your website usually that's through blogging, also through your job board, so that we're adding new pages all the time that are optimized for search. In the olden days, we worried about how many times do we put keywords on a page and did we have the right information in the meta descriptions? Well, guess what? We don't worry about that to nearly the same extent. It's not completely gone, but Google's changes in their algorithms over the last few years have said, essentially, it's more about great content. If you write for your human being readers, if you attract them to your website, if you create content they share on social media and that other people link to, you're going to rank higher. And again, we've only got limited time today, so we're not going to talk a lot about SEO strategies, but if you want to see a full hour on this topic, go to our website, go to the freebie section, and watch our on-demand webinar on SEO. And again, for your own website, if you're not regularly adding content, if you're not blogging at least once a week, it is sort of an essential function now for staffing companies to produce content if you want to continue to be found online. The last area that's really changed greatly is hosting. And I kind of added this in right before the presentation because we're running into more and more issues with people saying, hey, look, I can get hosting from 
this other organization for six bucks a month. But hosting today for most companies is much more than just hosting. Because when it comes to managing your website, it's more than having files on a server. Yes, the site itself has to be hosted. But a big problem these days is security. Um, a good host makes sure that you're not aware of how many people are trying to attack your site every day. We see attacks on the servers we host, where we host at Rackspace, and other sites every week. Our job as a host, the job of any good host, is to provide a team that is there to defend the site, help ensure the security of your web presence against outside attackers. If you're using a really small company, if you're using someone that is hosting out of their bedroom because it's a cheap deal, you're going to get hacked. We've seen it happen to multiple companies this year, and when you get hacked, you might completely lose your website. The worst case we saw was an organization that not only had their site hacked, but couldn't get access to the files afterwards and had to essentially rebuild their website from scratch. So you want to host with a company that's providing security. You also want to host with a company that's updating your content management system. We build all of our websites in WordPress. There are updates to WordPress sometimes every week, at least every couple of months. Your host, if you're generally speaking, unless you're paying for managed hosting services, does not update for you. You're responsible for doing all the updates. If you're out of date, your site's going to be vulnerable to security issues. Your site may not continue to function properly. So you want to make sure that your host is taking care of updates on your behalf. They're also managing your site for speed because that's one of Google's ranking factors is how fast do pages load. So you want someone who's looking for ways to make your servers faster. You also want someone who's doing daily backups because we're talking about computer programming here and things can go wrong. They do go wrong. You want to make sure that you know if you went in and you accidentally made a change to your website and you said, oh no, I don't know how to undo that. You want to make sure that there's a backup that you can recover from. You also want to think about scalability. If your business is going to grow greatly in other parts of the United States, maybe in other parts of the world, can your host help you scale your site? Does their infrastructure have the ability to scale? And finally, is the host monitoring your site 24 hours, 7 days a week? They may have a live person doing it. They may have automated monitoring. But someone's got to be monitoring that site to really provide you with managed hosting. And that is probably the cheapest insurance you can buy is a managed hosting program versus looking at what is the cheapest way to get my site hosted. All right, final wrap up. How do you get more ROI from your website? Let's do a quick run through everybody here. Number one, Caitlin. More features that enable action. So gone are the days of a website that just needed to be a pretty online brochure. Your website can work for you and it can do so much for you and your company if you just use some features that enable users to take action. Awesome. All right, Brian. Calls to action on every page. Uh, this is really hopefully pretty self-explanatory. Like I said earlier, people aren't on your website for the sake of coming to your website regardless of how awesome it is. You're bringing them there for a reason and they are there for a reason. Give them that action that you want them to take. Make it clear. Don't leave them searching for it. So clear, precise calls to action on every single page. Excellent. Hey, Mark, what's your thought? Minimum mobile content. Your website's got a lot of content on it, a lot of images, a lot of copy. And when you're trying to get mobile page load to be quick, that's not a good formula for it. So what you have to do is prioritize your content. You want your users to get what they need and get it fast. Excellent. Thanks. Kaylin. Forms. So forms are a great way to capture leads and generate leads, but you want to make sure they're easy to fill out. You as a user probably know you're a lot less likely to fill out a form that has multiple pages or tons of required fields. So just try to keep your form short and limit the fields whenever possible. Excellent. I'm going to take the next one, which is on goal tracking. Uh, one of the features that you, if you should look at using in Google Analytics is to be able to set up goals, which are defining what do I want a person to do who visits the website and then I can track if they came in from my blog did they apply to a job did they request information on our services you can use goal tracking to really measure the performance of your website and the flow of traffic through your website to make sure you're optimizing the experience and maximizing the response and that's really directly related to the last one marketing automation and mark what are your thoughts on marketing automation 
Marketing autom automation is all about trying, is all about tying your website into your CRM. You want to be able to track your leads that come in through your site, your blog, your social media platforms, and see where they go on your website, what actions they take, and if you want to, you can run an email campaign and see which messages they've opened and how they've interacted with them. Awesome, thanks. And the other thing about marketing automation is you can automate every form going into your CRM. You can track people coming back to your site and you can start scoring leads based on their actions on your website and then pass it over to sales when it looks like they're really ready to talk to you. All right, we promised a quick pitch and I promise to keep it quick since we're a couple minutes over. If you are interested in updating your website, improving the mobile experience, just getting more information on the ideas that we've talked about today. We'd love to show you examples of our starter sites that we mentioned a couple of times and how we've managed to create awesome designs, feature rich, fully optimized for mobile, and about 30% less than what we would have charged to do the same thing just two years ago. And if you are looking for something wild and custom, we love those too, so we'd love to talk to you. The other thing that we can offer, and this is the offer part, if you're thinking about a new website, we've got an, a terrific checklist available. So give us a call or email us, and we'll be happy to get you a copy of our staffing website features checklist so you can plan the content or just even review the content on your own site. All right, that said, there are some questions that have come in. Um, I will stay on the line and creative team if you wouldn't mind staying because I may need your help on a couple of these. There's about a half a dozen that we're going to answer. While we do that, just to let everybody know, we've got two webinars coming up. Um, one is about online reputation, stopping the trolls, and protecting your firm from negative comments. So that's going to be on Thursday, May 21st at 2 o'clock. And then one week later, on the 28th, I'll be coming back to do a demo of the Talent Showcase to show you in great detail what it is, how it works, and how you might be able to adapt it for use in your organization. All right, so let's come back and let's talk about these questions. So first and foremost is the landing pages and home pages. Caitlin, the question is, are they different? Yes, 100%. <laughs> so your home page is the first page you see of your website. A landing page might not even be on your website. A landing page exists on its own. It might match the branding of your main website, but it probably is laid out completely differently. On a landing page, again, it has one focus and one purpose. So you probably don't have a navigation that links to all the other pages of your site. Um, instead, you just have one clear call to action. That can exist, for example, um, if you're running a pay-per-click campaign, it can say something like your company.com slash request an employee. That could be a landing page that people will get to on its own and it will just have the request an employee form there. Excellent, thank you. All right, another question. Um, Brian, I think this is for you, is about analytics. And when we're talking about mobile sites versus responsive sites, uh, is, how do we deal with the fact that we have analytics and we have potentially multiple sites? Uh, well, that is where, uh, so one of the questions earlier about having your mobile site on a subdomain, those would actually be tracked as two, as two separate websites. Um, so is the question how, how would we differentiate between mobile versus desktop traffic? I, th I think on, the difference is, is sort of what you said, you know, do you have to have different analytics or is it really just still one set of Google Analytics? So uh, if you have a separate subdomain and it's a completely separate mobile site, you got two sets of analytics, but when we're doing it with the plug-in or you're doing it just responsively, if, correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it's really just one set of analytics, one place to monitor all your traffic. Right, yeah. The, the, the way that we do it, which I said is a little bit of a hybrid, so the responsive way or, or separate site, the way that we do it, it's really it's one website, so it's one set of analytics. We're just presenting that content differently. It is one website, though. However, if you, if you go with a separate website solution that actually um, has you uh, managing your content on a different system, maybe a separate content management system or separate host, that would be two sets of analytics most likely. Thank you. All right, another question was about the content that we just talked about on mobile versus desktop. So is it possible there would be content on the desktop that's not on the mobile? Yes, um, that's, that's very likely. And... Uh, 
most of the time, probably to a certain extent, what we would want to do. Um, the reason being, we're somebody visiting your website on a desktop is just going to be capable and in a position to do more. Um, so there, there are certain things that we don't want to waste a, mobile's, a mobile user's time with, and we will strategically um, eliminate certain pieces of desktop-specific content, certain plugins that we may have activated, uh, certain pieces of functionality um, that, that we're just not going to bother the mobile user with. So yeah, we, we, we absolutely will have, will have certain things on desktop, but again, it comes down to strategy and it's a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. A couple more questions came in about landing pages. Um, number one, should the land, do you create, create a landing page for a different site like an ad or PPC? And usually a landing page is done in one of two ways. It is coming from an off-site link. So yes, a pay-per-click ad, we are driving somebody to take an action like check out our latest ebook or watch our webinar or apply for this job. And we go to a landing page where they have one action to take. But even within a website, there may be things you want people to do. You would send them to a landing page where they're not going to get distracted. So maybe you want someone to learn about a new service by contacting you. You might send them to a landing page just about that service and the only action that they can take is to request more information. Now to not annoy them, I might open that up in a new browser window so that they don't lose being on your website, but we open it up with the, on the landing page in a separate window. I don't want the, <clears throat> the visitor distracted with other things that they can do. And, and speaking about right. conveying information, we had our first question about video. Um, everybody seems to be pushing video. Guys, what's your opinion? Do you think video is a number one priority? Mm, I, yeah, Caitlin, do you, did you want to say something here? <laughs> um, I, I think video is, is definitely on the rise, um, but I think you need to use it strategically. I think it might be replacing slideshows in a lot of areas. Um, people think that having a static image is boring, so they add a slideshow. And I think it's been proven that if you have 10 slides that are five seconds each, nobody's waiting there to see your, all of your slides. So maybe video is a little more dynamic, and it is a little more interesting. I would agree with that. But you have to be careful when using it, because any kind of movement on your site is going to be a distraction. So you really want the video to be probably in the background, probably subtle, and make it highlight something else. So have some big clear calls to action on top of that video or that go along with that video. Um, alternatively, you can do something like a About Us video and that's always great to show a little more personality, but you can't guarantee that all of your users are going to watch that. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, as videos pertain to like the, the Talent Rover example that we had earlier where it was a background video like Caitlin was talking about there, it, it's important to to remember that that video is more supplemental. It's there to to help to provide some sort of context around the content. That isn't the content. It's it's you know what the content is is lying over. So that should not be the primary focus. It's supplemental. Yeah, and one of the other things about about video is um, where it can be very beneficial is usually video requires separate hosting requirements. So you, the easiest and free place to do it is to host your videos on a channel you control at YouTube, um, because YouTube can serve up video which has high bandwidth requirements. YouTube's also a pop, the second most popular search engine, so that can help with your SEO to have lots of YouTube videos there that are also embedded in your website. Uh, that is a good use of video. But as Brian said. Video is a way to help convey information. I wouldn't say it's the most important way unless it is the most effective way to tell a particular story. So maybe a customer testimonial, video might be the most powerful way to do it. But some people, like if I'm on a mobile device, I may not, and I'm, and I'm using cellular access, I may not want for a video to load. So I wouldn't want my most important content to be video only. If I can add right. something too, um, Berks and Beyond, for example, they, they use a lot of big storytelling elements, but they have a few videos throughout their site that back everything that they say up, and it shows their personality and in a fun and short little way to really bring that point to the, to the front. Okay, excellent. Thanks, guys. Um, and we're going to do just a couple more. I'm going to apologize for those people we don't get to. We will reply offline after this is over, but we're already about 15 minutes over, and I don't want to keep everybody in line too long. The next uh, question 
Um, it's a question really about posting to LinkedIn, and does that help with the weekly blogging needs? So if, if I'm regularly sharing content on LinkedIn, does that su suffice for adding content to my website? Guys, what are your thoughts? <laughs> um, are they are they just writing, or are they sharing other blogs, or are they writing their own content and then putting it on LinkedIn? I, I, they, the question wasn't clear, but I got the impression from the question that it was a matter of they're just posting something on LinkedIn, not on adding it to their own website. I think it's much more important to have content on your own website with content that's tailored to you, be it specific blog posts or even short stories or testimonials here and there, and then sharing that to LinkedIn. I would argue the more places you have content, the better. Right, yeah, definitely just the more. doing LinkedIn probably wouldn't suffice. Right, but making sure that content is still on your website is is, is definitely important. You don't want to be posting these individual avenues and and not have the content present on your website as well. There's there's just there's no good reason to not have that that content present on your website because that's. Sure, you want to you want to establish a little bit of a presence on these social media networks, but you want that content on your website as well. There's no good reason to not have it there. Yeah, and there's sort of two different answers to that. One is from an SEO perspective, adding content to LinkedIn that's not on your website does nothing because you're not driving traffic to your website. So adding it to your website is better for SEO. But from a social engagement standpoint, if you're using LinkedIn's blogging features and you're blogging on LinkedIn, LinkedIn does a great job of putting your content in front of other people that might be interested and they have their own reach. So the ideal world would be to have content that's on your website and then a second variation of it that you share in LinkedIn driving back to the first right. variation. So LinkedIn is promoting it but you're still driving people back to your website and you're using the content for SEO. All right, last question was about ATS integration and considering that a staffing website's main purpose for a lot of companies is to show jobs but those jobs sit in the ATS. Um, what do you do about hosting the jobs? How do you deal with that? Um, Caitlin, would you? <laughs> <laughs> Can you repeat the question, though? Yeah, it's really about the importance of hosting jobs. We see a lot of ATSs where the jobs are in the ATS. How do you, how do you deal with them on your website? What's the strategy for maximizing the value of those jobs on your website? So, I would say um, try to get as much information from your ATS as possible. Try to get feeds of jobs. Try to sort those feeds by different categories. That way you can still have the job presence on your site rather than just linking everything off-site. Um, so letting can candidates see hot jobs, feature jobs on the home page. Maybe you have a category of IT jobs versus engineering jobs. Um, you also want to add some kind of form probably to capture that candidate's information, whether it's integrated with the ATS or not. Um, but ideally, everything would be integrated. Thanks, Kevin. And usually with the ATSs, there's three strategies. The ATS will give you a portal that you can link to, and you're just linking to their website. Um, that, from an SEO perspective, does nothing for you, and it's best to see if there's a way to get that job content on your website directly. Second is they may give you the ability to iframe their application on your web page. The iframes, if that's the only choice, that's the only choice. The problem with an iframe is it's not mobile friendly at all, and again, the content is not on your site. The best alternatives allow you to pull a feed of content, an XML feed, an RSS feed, from the ATS, pull that into an application running on your website so that all of the jobs are on your site. Our job board that we showed earlier, that's how we set ours up so we can pull the jobs out of the ATS, put them on your site, and then when somebody goes to apply, we can go back into the ATS with the application. So it's, it's a complex question, and it depends on the ATS you're using, what options they will make available. All right, guys, I want to thank everybody very much. Uh, creative team, thank you so much for your input on today's call. And to everybody who has stuck with us for an hour and 20 minutes, really appreciate your time uh, and your patience as we work through our earlier audio efforts. Again, Next Lunch with Haley is in just a few weeks. Um, come learn about reputation management. And from all of us, thank you very much for your participation in today's Lunch with Haley event.